And to me, I think okay. we definitely need to take a little action to change what okay. we're doing. <clears throat> uh, I guess that's next. Um, I think the the biggest issue. I, I don't really want to call it like label it biggest or not, but what a lot of people are concerned about is the U.S. economy, the overgrown so debt. Economic so issues. especially with Bernie, considering his, you know, his rather. I wouldn't want to say radical, but different than everybody else's. Right. So right. I think that's a big concern. Right. 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 Radical's okay. <laughs> I just didn't want like radical is kind of like it has a negative connotation. Yeah. yeah. So unlike some people, yeah. unlike other people. Sure. Um, so for me, the most important issue is going to be education because if we have an education, educated population, then we can um, combat climate change and we can fight against you know, economic inequality, like we can see it and more readily address it. And I just feel like we're, we'll have more tools and, and uh, more people um, to fight all these things going on in the world when we're educated. Right. I think that, uh, if someone's wondering where I'm from, I'm from former Soviet Union. Anyway, so uh, I think the most important problem is income inequality in the United States. Because right now, it's like, it's so bad. It's, right. like, it's right. like an emergency situation. You know, it has to be solved. Otherwise, even Alan Greenspan, you know, he's not a liberal clerk. Alan Greenspan, you wouldn't think he would address it, but he said, if you want result income inequality, the United States will cease to be a democracy, you know. It's democracy in the United States will cease to exist. And I think, uh, like, the core, the fundamental issue is income inequality. And education is a kind of growing out of it, because to maintain, like, to right. decrease it, right. you need to provide education. And healthcare is also kind of related to it, because if you, healthcare bankrupts you, I mean, of course, but, but this is a one of fundamental. And second issue fundamental is a co campaign influence, like okay. finance. I've never seen anything in my life, you know, when something which is on paper democratic, but you can pay your way through, you know, like. Right. I want to take two more, because you all are a talkative group, <laughs> if that's OK. I just I wanted to get a sense of things. Maybe there, there are two people back here. I, I would just add to the campaign financing, like literally every other thing that y'all talked about, whether it's climate change, income inequality, education, health care, cannot be solved as long as we have this corrupt campaign finance yep. system. Yep. We're never going to break up the big banks if if Hil with Hillary getting millions of dollars from Goldman Sachs yep. and insurance companies, and, and it just goes on. And the collapse in 2008, no one went to jail for this. Yeah. Yeah. So he stole the words right out of my mouth. I'll just <laughs> add that Senator Sanders is the only major candidate to provide a route towards robust publicly funded elections, which would destroy that power that he mentioned. OK, well, let me, let, let, let's, I want to talk a little bit about uh, TPP, uh, and kind of my background about that is I knew nothing. <laughs> I was, you know, when I was asked to found the, the Texas Fair Trade Coalition by a national coalition, uh, we had a little study group here in Austin, and it, we, it, we'd only been meeting for a couple months, and all of a sudden there was this thing called the WTO, and we literally, we were, and we, we went, what in the world is the WTO? We had none of us, and this included Bob Jensen, who was a journalism professor, and others. Um, and so that was like a month or two before the WTO in Seattle, which was before your all's time. But it was a huge, gigantic explosion in the media about WTO, because there was huge protest in Seattle. Wow. And so I went there, and I learned a lot. Uh, there were speakers literally from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, all over downtown Seattle, the best speakers in the world on the issue. I didn't take notes, but I saw Vendana Shiva a number of times, Walden Bellow a number of times, Maude Burlow. These are really important. All three of those people won alternative Nobel Prizes. They're the leaders of the corporate globalization movement. So I was, I was hired to defeat the free trade area of the Americas, which was the NAFTA, for, for all the countries of the Americas, from Chile to Canada, except for Cuba, of course. Um, and so, but I, my, my, because of Seattle and everything that I heard, my interest kind of went further to kind of the bigger corporate, 
corporate globalization battle that was going on. Um, and I, I, I really kind of, probably because of Seattle and because of other things I had done, I really saw that through the eyes of the global south, the poor countries of the world. They were the people that really educated me about that. And so we didn't defeat the free trade area of the Americas in the United States, but they just put an end to it in Latin America. The, the socialists were starting to come in about that time, and they didn't want any part of this trade agreement. Um, and part of, part of the reasons that these trade agreements are really attacks, fundamentally attacks on democracy. Fundamentally, that's what they're about. Um, I'm going to look at notes just to make sure I stay, but um, for instance, in, the, in TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 12 countries around the Pacific Rim, um, the, the texts were never released before the vote on Fast Track. Fast Track determines, it, it, it makes it very, very easy to pass the trade agreement. You always have to vote first on tra Fast Track. Fast Track is a yes or no vote. And it takes out a lot of the investigative functions of the committees. So it just whizzes through Congress because c Congress people are in a corner. If they vote against the trade agreement, they're painted as anti-trade, which is not the truth. They just want, they would like t to amend it. And that isn't allowed under fast track. So you had cut the, this fast track vote. Hardly anyone had seen it. Representative Grayson from Florida was one of the, the few. He was issued into an, a room with a computer. He, he couldn't bring pencil and paper. He couldn't bring an aid. He could read it. But when he came back out, he said, by law, I can't tell you what I saw. But all I can tell you is it's much worse than anything you saw, that anything that you think. Any of the rumors that are out there. Um, so. Let's look at TPP. Um, it was, how many corporate people, I won't do that, uh, 600 corporate representatives were given credentials to be a part of the process. 600 of them. They had access to the text. In fact, corporations wrote much of it. They would write huge chapters and give it to a, a trade representative from different countries, and it would then be introduced. They wrote most of it. You didn't see farmers, you didn't see environmentalists, you didn't see unions, you didn't see people concerned about health care, you didn't see any of those people at the table during the negotiations. It was, some of it was leaked, but they, they had no say period at all. And that's under Obama. It was worse under Obama than the trade agreements under Bush. Uh, the secrecy that, that went in and the fact that people were really excluded and they were always been excluded but they, they he went to an extra step in excluding people. Um, the old trade agreements were 20 pages. They were about bananas and steel and stuff going across borders and taxes and that sort of thing. They were really little documents. NAFTA was 500. We went, one trade agreement, we went from 20 to 500. The reason it went, because trade agreements now were really corporate wish lists. They're things that they have, would have a hard time getting through democratic pro, uh, process in countries. So they put it all in a trade agreement. It's, it's negotiated in secret, then it's put it before Congress and fast track rules where they can't really investigate it and they can't amend it. So NAFTA was 500. Trans-Pacific Partnership is over 2,000 pages because it's worse than the rest. It's, you know, it's all these things that corporations want to get through, want to get past, but they can't do it through democratic process in all these countries. So they, they steamroll it in, the, in, a, in a trade agreement. Um, I mean, some of those, some, in, you know, I'll, I'll cover investor state because that's really my theme is the attack on democracy. But I also want to mention, I lived in Asia at one time, and the fiercest opposition to the WTO and the fiercest opposition to trade agreements came, came from health advocates, people that represented people who had AIDS and other really horrible illnesses, and they were going to die because they were going to be, they, the patents would be extended and they wouldn't be able to get generic medicines. They don't have insurance. They just die. 
the last time I looked, the World Health Organization said that there were 30 to 30 million people living with AIDS. 10 million of those people got drugs. The rest died. And this would make that horrible condition even worse. And that's just one little thing. Investor state is really, really important. Um, if you want to check out all this stuff, go to Citizens Trade Campaign. Citizens Trade Campaign. That's the national coalition, which includes the unions and religious group and Friends of the Earth and Sierra Club and Public Citizen, uh, National Farmers Union, Family, Family Farm Coalition. It's the coalition that's fighting this. And the Texas Fair Trade Coalition is a part of that coalition. Um, so investor state, go to Citizens Trade Campaign. But it's, uh, what it is is, it, well, I'll give a couple of quick examples. El Salvador, uh, they have gold mining. The gold mining uses lots of really toxic chemicals that get into their rivers. They have no water treatment plants in the whole country. So they're completely dependent on water that's drinkable. And all these toxic chemicals are making the water uh, undrinkable. So they're big, so they passed a law, you know, they have the, the remnants of the old uh, guerrillas are actually in government there at this point, FMLF. Um, and so they passed a law outlawing these chemicals. They're being sued under CAFTA by a Canadian company that had headquarters in the United States, so it's part of this CAFTA trade agreement. And their law is a barrier to free trade. It's a it's a barrier to corporations maximizing their profits. It's really that simple. The case will not be heard in, the, in, a, in a, a court in El Salvador. It will not be court, uh, heard in a court in, um, you know, in Canada or the United States. Where the case will be heard is in a secret, in a secret, in a secret tribunal. The only people that have the credentials to be jurists or corporate lawyers. There's a woman named Lori Wallach who works for Public Citizen, which Ralph Nader, you probably all don't know Ralph Nader, but, or maybe you do. But um, anyway, he started Public Citizen. It's a very important organization. She's a corporate, she's a lawyer. She said, I couldn't be a jurist because I didn't have that corporate experience, which is one of the requirements. So it's a rigged deal. Um, and Salvador is being sued for $75 million in one suit, $325 million in another suit, and it'll be heard by a corporate ju jurist in a secret tribunal, not in their country, but in a secret tribunal. That's uh, what uh, Investor State is about. Canada, uh, Ottawa passed a law to protect the river from American fracker who wanted to frack there. They're being sued by the American fracker. It'll be heard by a corporate jurist, jurist in the secret tribunal. And they, will, they can keep their law. El Salvador can keep their law. But what they'll have to do is pay lost profits forevermore. They can keep their law, but you have, the, you have this poor country that's going to have to pay lost profits. And they can't afford that. And there are lots of examples of that sort of thing. But it is, it's environmental laws, it's all rules and regulations, it's all judicial, all, all judicial opinion, opinions, which includes the Supreme Court, as I read it. Um, and all of that can be challenged. Anything that you care about that's codified in a law or regulation and judicial opinion, a company can come here from a foreign company, from a foreign uh, country, under, you know, like uh, NAFTA, it would be uh, Canada or Mexico, can come here and challenge all our laws, regulations, and judicial opinions. Food safety laws, uh, blah, 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 it can all be challenged. That's what investor state is about. So this, you know, we weren't there to negotiate this, so it's anti-democratic as far as I'm concerned. Only the corporations were at the table. If you really wanted a solution to this, you would have everyone at the table to negotiate these things so that the result would look real different. But that isn't what's happening. This is, Bernie's against it. Hillary supports free trade agreements. She's now said after, you know, her husband, 
was uh, there when NAFTA was signed. And there were lots of trade agreements, the free trade area of America is the big one that I worked on, but lots and lots of other ones. She never spoke up about those trade agreements. But now she said she's against the TPP. But when she said it, there was a huge caveat, you know, and she said, well, if it changes. So God knows what sort of little change would be necessary for her to then support it. She's essentially lying as far as I'm concerned, because there's a there's a 25 year history in her family and her supporting supporting uh, free trade agreements. Um, you 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 and Trump against free trade agreements. Huh? You and Trump against free trade agreements. Trump, yeah, Trump is against free trade. Yeah, Trump and Trump. Who knows what that yes, means, though? When Trump will say anything. He's completely insane, but from what I see, he's, every time he asks about free trade agreements, he's serious. Make, make impression of being serious, but I think he is. You know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about <laughs> but, Trump. <laughs> but my point is I'm that Hillary Trump. is afraid that even Trump is... is on paper, at least, against it, she's still for she, She's pushed to attack, uh, but caveat is here. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that's one way Bernie really separates himself from Hillary. The issue of war, he really separates himself from Hillary. I wanted to talk about climate change. I, you know, like I said about trade, I learned uh, about trade through the, the activists in the global south from poor countries. Uh, some of the or my friends at this point. Um, you know, organizations that you don't know about, like Jubilee South, which is a real important organization, and lots of others. Um, so I, the climate, that's where I started. I was, I was in Asia, someone asked me to go to this climate conference. I had no idea what it was when they asked me. They, they, they were an organization that wanted information, so I said, okay, I'll go if you'll pay for my ticket, which was a real cheap ticket. So I went, and it was in Bali, which is a really nice place to go. <laughs> uh, but, and what happened there, I didn't take away a lot. I didn't know anything about climate, or I knew about that much about climate. Uh, but, and I learned a little bit there. I learned just enough to want to learn a lot more. Uh, one of the things I learned was from Walden Bellow, who I mentioned earlier, and he came out, we weren't in, I was with a group called Via Campesito, which is an international movement of small farmers, uh, peasant farmers, um, that's headquartered in Indonesia but operates worldwide. And Walden said, they're completely ignoring the scientists inside the conference. We should form alliances with the scientists because they're getting ignored. So I went home and I read and read and read for three months and it was really like entering an alternative universe. This was uh, in January, February, March of 2008 and every morning, I mean I literally would get up in the morning and said, I really hope I read something today that says that everything else was bullshit <laughs> and my world can go back to where it was four months ago. Yeah, but it wasn't, I, you know, what I read, what, what, it was really kind of, I got good people to say, you know, why don't you read this or why don't you read that. Uh, one of them, it was a really good book, Mark Linus, Six Degrees, Our Future of a Hot, Hotter Planet, uh, which scientists kind of say, oh, we'll get to three or four or five or six degrees Celsius. Uh, they don't define what that means. Um, it, it means horrible things because it's happened before and it's in the geologic record, and both climate modelers and people that go into the geologic record know what's happened before, um, and that's what I was reading. Um, and it was a horrible experience, but I, anyway, it, I, I came back to Texas, I worked on Waxman Mark, I got together a small group of people, we worked on state, I'd worked statewide before, so I had contacts, the person that I hired had worked statewide before, so she had contacts. And we started working in all the Democratic districts in Texas, which was kind of a lot for there were just three of us. Uh, but that's what we started doing. Uh, we, we finally, uh, we came out against Wax and Markey at the end. We, we fought for it. We tried, to, along with a lot of other people, to amend it and we weren't successful. So at the end, a lot of us went against it. And a lot of us include Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace and Dr. James Hansen, who knows him? One. 
he's, I'll mention him again. He's, uh, he was the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies for over 30 years. He's done the two, I think, the two most important uh, pieces of climate research over the last seven years, easily the most important research over the, he, he, he challenged the orthodoxy and because he's so good and he had a bunch of NASA scientists behind him, uh, they were somewhat successful. Who knows 350.org? So you're all not really into climate, are you? <laughs> it, it's a very, anyway, it's a very big international climate organization that came out of his research of, about safety. The, the, the scientific consensus was that 450 parts per million is safe. And he said, it isn't if you keep the, if you, and we're at over 400 at this point, and we're gonna go sailing past 450. He said, if you keep the climate at 450 parts per million CO2 concentration long enough, it will melt practically every piece of ice in the world. And the seas will go up 75 meters, not feet, not inches, 75 meters. Imagine what that would do to all the coastal cities. Um, and that was in April 2008. And recently, um, he challenged that the, the scientific consensus has been that a, a temperature rise from pre-industrial of two degrees is safe. And he got a bunch of scientists together, and they researched that. And he said one degree Celsius rise is safe, which is what we're at now. It's already risen one degree. Uh, the, the UN Climate Conference adopted two degrees and they, with, a, with a hope that it would be at 1.5, it would be maintained there. But unfortunately, Paris was a huge disaster. Um, and that isn't just me saying it. So I'm on the international list and the people in the international list, almost all of them, were concluded that Paris was a disaster. I have a handout that I can hand to all of you. Hansen called it bullshit and a fraud. This is our most distinguished scientist. <laughs> you know, so he's in his 70s. He's twice committed civil disobedience and mountaintop removal, and there's a coal plant that, uh, that fuels the, or provides electricity for the White House, and he tried to close it out with other people one day. Uh, but he's easily the most distinguished scientist in the world. He's de facto leader of the world scientific community. And, his opinion was it was bullshit and, and a fraud. Um, some of the reasons that, it, that that was true is they came there and they adopted 2.0 and hoping they would do that. They said, well, if we can, we'll keep it at 1.5. But the, the, their pledges from all the different countries, when you did the math, will take it past three. And we're not going to revisit that for five years. It would have been a, a decent, you know, treaty 15 years ago, but we're not 15 years ago. We're we're much closer. It's all voluntary. It won't go into effect until 2020. And and it it, it again on the people in the global south, you know, this is our problem here in this country largely because our per capita emissions are, they're twice what Europe's is, are. Twice what Europe's, our per capita emissions. Our total historical emissions are much higher than any other place. You have, you know, I was in Peace Corps in Kenya. Their emissions are just minuscule compared to ours. But Ken, Africa is gonna bear the brunt of this. There's, there was a, a Christian aid was a group that took you know, I, I, there's a big scientific organization, thousands of scientists that do reports every, every, uh, every six years called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They took a chart which is very conservative, operates by consensus, always underestimates, and after the science underestimates, the, the politicians then edit their statement line by line by line, the 195, so it, they're really underestimate. Um, where was that right before that? Um, Africa, yeah, Africa. So Christian Aid in UK took a, a chart from IPCC, extended it till the end of the universe, end of this century, and found that a, a, under very certain conservative estimates that 182 million Africans would die as a direct result of climate change by the end of this century. 
And I wouldn't use it because it was from this Christian aid organization in UK, but they took IPC, which interests me. And then a guy named John, Sir John Houghton, he's a very, very senior uh, scientist at the IPCC. He was one of the founders, uh, and he said they're right about their estimate of 182 million deaths by the end of the century. Remember, that's a very conservative estimate. The people where I were in northern Kenya are just going to get wiped out. They're in the ed, not on the, if you go about 200 miles north of where I was, these are wonderful people. Who follows track and field? Who, who wins a lot of, of everything from 800 meters up through the marathon? Who wins? Kenyans. Kenyans. They're all Nandi, mm -hmm. almost all of them. With the Nandi people, with the people that I was working with, and they're just truly wonderful people. And they're going to get wiped out because they're too close to where it's very dry already. So that's, and, and so what, what Paris did was say, you know, in Kyoto in 97, there was an agreement that, that, that poor countries would have their space for development. Those that had created most of the emissions and had profited from those emissions by their industrialization should take the lead and have deeper cuts than poor countries. That's pretty sensible, you know. That was in 2009 in Copenhagen, that was rolled back some, and then this year it was completely discarded. The, the Kyoto Protocol was completely discarded. Um, and they're going to be given a little bit of money, a uh, hundred, hope, you know, there's pledge, but these pledges don't mean a whole lot. Pledging a hundred billion a year, they really need four or five hundred billion. We spent 80 billion on just Hurricane Sandy. Just one event, we spent 80. And this 100 billion is supposed to cover all of the global south, all the poor countries. That ain't going to happen. And most of, by, by, the, by, by Paris and, and, and other agreements, most of uh, the money will go to buy Western technology. So we'll benefit again. And it won't go to what's really needed, which is protecting their people from the ravages of climate change in the coming decades. So Bernie is good, on, really good on this. Hillary is uh, friends of Obama. I mean, essentially, it, Obama is largely responsible for the bad agreement in Copenhagen and Oman and the one in Paris. That the United States leads the pack on this. And they have other people that want to join. But the United States, if the United States ever said, no, we're not going to do that, he's operating on, uh, you know, the Republicans con control largely. So there are some uh, pressure on him, but that's who he is. You know, he, there are a lot of things he could have done differently, and he didn't on climate. And Hillary's lockstep with him on climate. So this is another really good reason if, you know, we're, that, that, who, know what's, who knew what the Pope said, or Dalai Lama said, coming up to, um, to Paris? Paris was early December. The Dalai Lama said that this isn't really about politics. This is about the extinction of humankind. This is the Dalai Lama. The Pope, the Pope said this is akin to suicide. Popes are, are scientists. You know, he, I'm sure he follows it. And if you read the scientific literature, I don't read, I read really good journalists who tell me what the scientists are saying, but if you read that stuff, uh, it's really absolutely frightening. And, you know, I have two granddaughters, they're four and one and a half. You know, I'm, I have their picture about my desk. That, you know, I'm, you know, it, it, Unless we do something really, really fast, um, you know, the world's going to be a horrible place for all of us, even me at my age. So Bernie is important. We need to fight this. Don't get depressed. If anyone <laughs> here is getting depressed, <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, truly. You, people have, you know, the Zapatistas had a struggle for 400 years. There are lots of people that have had long struggles, and they overcame. Don't get depressed. You fight. You organize. Don't mourn. Organize, which is the saying among organizers. Don't mourn. Organize. Organize. Do something. 
Get Bernie elected. That's your job right now. Get Bernie elected. Um, let me look at this. Uh, that is, you know, Exxon Mobil, you know, they lied. Did, did anyone see the stories in the last couple of minutes? Uh, but yeah, they've been lying since the not since the 70s. In the 70s, the oil and gas, you know, you have liars here in, in some of your departments that have issued reports and fracking that they had to withdraw because there were so many conflicts of interest. Then two years after that, they did another report and there's still conflicts of interest. The, the guy that was the lead author, at least he said, I have this huge conflict of interest. But this woman who wrote a lot of it never said that she was a, she was a, um, she was a, she worked for oil and gas companies as an engineer. She never said that. Um, so ExxonMobil, that their scientists in the 70s were saying the same thing as all the other scientists. And they did it until sometime in late 80s and all of a sudden they changed they changed. You know, their the accountants said, we can't do this. It's going to hurt our business. So they hired, they got rid of a lot of scientists. They hired new scientists. They're more amenable and they paid a lot of scientists. You know, they, they did a lot, a lot of work to create that much doubt. And that much doubt would paralyze this country. And that's what it did for a very long period of time. They, there was a guy at Harvard, he, he was a Chinese American, I think, and he was paid, but he never, he did research, and he never said, I'm getting, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars from oil and gas interest. He never said it. And he's supposed to, when you research, you're supposed to say, where do you get your money from, and is there a conflict of interest? He forgot. Um, so, again, this, this should serve both TPP and climate change and war and other the reasons that people talked about are reasons that we all have to get Bernie elected. There is a shot, there is a shot even in Texas um, if we can mobilize enough. I was telling people before I started that I've talked too long. Um, and I was, t I, I was telling people, I went up to this past weekend to talk to Texas Farmers Union, which are really progressive farmers. They started, uh, actually in Point, Texas, east of Dallas, the National Farmers Union. There was the first meeting of the National Farmers Union. It started in Texas. Um, and they went out, it was like wildflower. This is the populist movement of that time and they went out and organized. Uh, anyway, I was there in Abilene, and I didn't know that there was a meeting of Bernie supporters that mm -hmm. weekend in Abilene. 83 people came, and they have a list of 700 people in Abilene, Texas. You know, there's nothing special about Abilene. It's, a, it's, it's the beginning of a West Texas town. It, where, it's not where you would expect this to happen but it's happening in Abilene, and I don't get around that much. Uh, I'm mostly here, although I'm gonna start traveling um, in the very near future, but you know, even in Abilene, and even in a lot of places, little communities, I'm sure there's stories about little communities in Iowa and, and other places. People are rallying to this. I, this is, you know, I'm older than you all, and, uh, and the only person I've seen that was anywhere close as a candidate to, to Bernie was Jesse Jackson in the 80s. And uh, he was drawing huge crowds of white farmers and, and white rural people in the Middle West. And they, they, he couldn't raise the money, he couldn't stay solvent, so he, you know, he gave it up. Uh, but Bernie has persisted, and he is persisting, and he tied, essentially tied in Iowa with a real good shot. And so, the, 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 you know, we got it, we want to win New Hampshire, most of you probably know this, and South Carolina, get a decent, we won't win, get a decent percentage. But then there are a lot of places like Nevada, Utah, and Texas that, uh, that are possible, but it, they're only possible if you do this sort of stuff. But if you do that sort of stuff, and there are enough of us doing that sort of stuff, then it's possible. But this, he's easily the best candidate in my lifetime. Easily. There was, you know, kind of wishy-washy anti-war candidates and this and that, but no one, no one anywhere near the progressive 
vision of Bernie across issues. You know, there were single issue candidates. He's no single issue candidate. You know, before many of you came, we were talking about why people supported him. So I'm going to end there and, and see if there are questions. Uh, what was the name of the NASA uh, senior scientist that uh, like agreed with the organization? Uh, James James Hansen. Hansen. Dr. James Hansen. Just Google Dr. James Hansen, uh, and you will get a lot of information. He's a pretty. He's one of the real heroes. There are lots of real heroes. I could talk about Texas. You know, the real heroes are even here in Austin. The real heroes, the Beulahs and the Halpins, and lots of people that are working a lot in climate. You can. Yeah, like, so what do we, like, I mean, even even when we get Bernie elected, I'm going to be optimistic. Okay. Um, like, at a state level, it's totally messed up, too. And I know that's how the whole, like, political revolution thing has to come into effect. Like, right. we have to, like, like down the board, progressive right. candidates. But, right. like, in Denton, the people voted. And I know. they banned fracking. HB 20, and 40. Greg Abbott and his, right. I know. And his I know. acolytes overruled the popular... Uh, the 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 vote of the people of Denton. I know, <laughs> but but they've come yeah. back. They adopted a, a, a plan to be 97% renewal, 70% renewal by 2019. They're still there and they're still working. I phoned one of them today for something else. They're still there. They're still working. You just don't give up. You keep you organize. You fight back. Other questions? I have a question about trade. So sometimes we hear that the only alternative to free trade is protectionism. How do you make a deal that encourages trade but does so in a way that's fair to all parties? All you have parties? all parties at the table writing the trade agreement. It, all parties at the table. That never happens. You know, that just, I remember when I was writing the Free Trade of the Americas, there was a, they had signed it and I think it was Buenos Aires, and you know, corporate people came to the party and no one else was invited. But we need to be at the table, and we need to demand that, that we're at the table. And there need to be protections for workers, and there need to be protections for the environment. This doesn't benefit anyone but corporate people. You know, it doesn't have been, you know, there are, there are gonna be a lot of jobs probably created in Vietnam, but Vietnam, unfortunately, was beaten into submission, and now they're a very capitalist country. Um, and they, their, their wages are very, very low. I mean, the phrase that people like me use is race to the bottom and wages and protections and all of that. Wherever the weight, you know, wherever the, the labor is cheaper, that's where the jobs go. Wherever it's cheaper, wherever the, 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 eco, the environmental protections are weakest, that's where the jobs go. So that has to be stopped, and Bernie's the only one that offers any chance at doing that. He's, you know, he, they're a horrible Congress, but um, it's important that he's there. Uh, I, I, I was just, uh, it's more, less of a question, but observation. Uh, what I noticed among environmentalists, you know, there is a thing called, I would call it uh, Al Gore syndrome. You know, when you fight for, you know, he was big, with big on uh, carbon emissions and all the things. Kind he, of. He, he all goddamn mentioned, right, which will yeah, produce no. so right. much of, of, of things. You know, and my observation is uh, that someone who fight for against climate change and drives F-150, Ford F-150, I mean, that's a not normal situation, right? But th that's another thing. So I grew up in, in ex-Soviet Union which is highly urban environment, which is like cities, more like New York City, not like uh, Texas or something. Right. The United States has unhealthy culture of suburban sprawl, you know. Right. And until there is a little bit change, uh, switch to more denser environment, walkable environment, right. public transportation, right. this will persist, you know. Every, every time environmentalists argue about things and drive 50 miles to I don't know, Pukai, whatever place from here, it's kind of dis discredited itself. How, 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 how to resolve this conundrum? On the other hand, to change this densified environment, it will create enough emissions to rebuild. I mean, the whole process of rebuilding dense cities will create a huge amount of 
in okay. issues also. How resources is conundrum? I mean, that you is get the, early elected. That, that's the first thing you do. Uh, you take the example of Georgetown, Texas. Who knows about what Georgetown did? This little place up the road. They're going to be 100% renewable by 2017. Hmm. 100%. And that was from students at Southwestern University that wanted more renewables. I forget the name of that. They signed, we did a resolution that was signed by 228 Texas organizations. God, it, it's almost in my mind. But anyway, it's a small environmental group at Georgetown. They asked their, their faculty, um, their administration, can we get more renewables? And, the, and the, 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 the administration took them seriously and asked the city council and the utility, what be involved in getting more renewables? The city council then did a two year study and they found they didn't care about the, the environmental those things. What they cared about was one thing, it was cheaper. Cheaper. Renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels but now. But still drive cars in Georgetown, right? Huh? Still everyone has a car. I mean, this is I know. I'm, I'm not saying this is a perfect world. We're a long, long way from that. But there, this is something that you can do. This is, you know, like I said before, Denton is 70% uh, renewables by 2019 in the very near future. Uh, we're, one thing, if you have time during the summer, we, we've, we've fought, I'm with a little solar sea gas no uh, coalition, and we got more, we, a lot more uh, solar, 600 megawatts of solar, additional, and then we're fighting a gas plant, a proposed a gas plant, natural gas plant, yeah. Half of it's frack gas, because that's the Texas uh, average. And we're fighting that. I think we're gonna win. We've won a lot of, we, you know, we've moved the city council. We've moved the city council. Um, and then my next step is to push everyone to shut down the present gas plant out near the airport and to divest. You know, Copenhagen just divested. The first big city to divest completely. Uh, so that's something that, and that's something you can do here after we elect Bernie. I know that. Are there? Did is anyone here worked on the divestment movement at the University of Texas? I looked into it, but I yeah, haven't worked on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, so that you know, if some of you were freshmen or sophomores, you know, after the election, that was maybe something you want to look at, and I would certainly help with that. Um, that what we're doing, a, we did this campaign to get a lot of people to sign a resolution, a lot of organizations, and that was a huge success. It was pretty amazing success. It was, it was six or eight times bigger than any letter or resolution in the history of Texas on the environment, and it was easily the most diverse. I mean, we had gay and lesbian groups, we had Muslim groups, we had grain groups, we had farmers, you know, we had Texas. And, and so people are concerned about this. It isn't just, you know, a couple of environmentalists here and there. People are seeing this chaotic weather and they're concerned. Um, you know, I, I made, Melissa did the same thing for our work with, we probably both made 2,000 telephone calls to, over about four months. I mean, it was just all day like this. And what was, what was really rewarding and just energized it is everyone said, uh, not everyone, but most people said, yes, and how can I help? Yes, and how can I help? You should talk to these people. You should talk to those people. Um, so, you know, people are concerned. So if, you, if there's an investment move, movement that starts again, I want to know about it because I want to help in the little ways that I can help, which is involving the community. We, I, I was a Central America activist in the 80s, and there we had Central America Peace Initiative in the community, and at University of Texas, we worked separately, but we came together when it was necessary. We collaborated a lot. We didn't control them, they didn't control us, but we worked closely together. And that, if, if there's another effort at divestment, I would, I would like to see if that can happen again. You know, coalitions are where our strength is. You know, all these different, the different people that signed the resolution, different people in the citizen trade campaign. That's where our strength is. It's a fight every single time in my lifetime between their money and our people. And if we organize, we can win. If we don't organize, we're not gonna win because they got lots and lots of money. I'm, I'm gonna tell a little, uh, if it's okay, tell a small story about organizing here in Texas and they, they were trying to privatize 20,000 state jobs. This was 97. 
20,000 is the biggest privatization. I don't, you all probably don't understand what privatization is all about. Bernie doesn't. Uh, but it, it's horrendous. I mean, it's basically asking a corporation to take over a function of the state, and they will, they will cut services. They will do everything they can do to create as much profit as possible. They don't care about services. So they were trying to privatize 20,000 state jobs. All the national unions came to Austin. The union I work with, Texas, Jeremy, I told you earlier, was Texas State Employees Union. We tried everything that we can do. But I was, I was um, kind of by happen chance. I was responsible for San Angelo and a bunch of West Texas. And there is this coalition that emerged, uh, black, brown, and white women, largely, and two white motorcycle guys from St. Angel State University. But basically this coalition of women from different, all the different, you know, the, and parole and the, the state school and uh, human services and Children's Protective and all of those people joined together. Um, and I was the cheerleader and that's about all I did. I set really good goals, but I, I was mainly a cheerleader. Um, and they did the work. We put 5,000 postcards into the office of Representative Janelle in three months. This is a, sm a relatively small town. He took notice about this. He needed friends out in West Texas, and he took notice. We would send 50 in a day over three months. Every day there'd be about 50. We didn't want to, we had different, different stamps. Of, you know, we varied the stamps. We wanted to make it seem uh, that people were, and it, well, people were, they were going to all their community groups, they were going to state employees, they covered the whole damn town. Um, and the, the last session of the legislature, he had thrown us out, the union out, don't ever come back to my office, was what he said, clearly, to the leaders. So, and we had, our first thing was we had a meeting with him out at San Angel State University, and I said, how many people have met with him before? And they said 30. And I said, let's try 100. So that became our goal. We had 125. And that was not because of me. I was a cheerleader. But it was because of all the people gathered together in coalition and made that happen. He was our friend right there. And then the postcard stuff started coming in. And so we, we were lost. In April, the session was coming to a close. We were going to lose, and this was the biggest privatization fight in the history of the United States. And the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and the New York Times were all covering it. And these women in San Angelo won it. He called our office. We didn't call him. He said, I want to sponsor your bill. Our bill was stuck in committee. Elliot Maystad couldn't get it out of Health and Human Services Committee. It was stuck. And he, he called and said, I want to sponsor your bill. And the, everyone was afraid of him because he was head of House Appropriations. All their bills came through his committee. Everyone was scared of him. And it, it just sailed through after that. And that was just organizing. It was coalition building and organizing with the keys to that. And it was power, powerless people, you would think. You know, these were state workers, not, none of them making a lot of money, but they banded together and did remarkable work. So, this we knew, we, question. Yeah, so um, generally I trust um, Bernie's foreign policy judgment, uh -huh. but it's something that he hasn't really emphasized, which is kind of surprising because um, it's the place, single place where he has the most independent influence. Uh -huh. So one thing I'm wondering is um, how would um, Bernie Sanders be able to um, leverage the use of soft power? Of um, what? Of, of soft power um, via the US. And also, how would he be able to coordinate global climate change and um, strike a fair balance between um, growth and combating climate change for development. Well, we, we need to forget the notion of growth, because that's a, that's a capitalist no notion, and that's what's got us into, into trouble. Uh, we need sustainable world, not sustainable growth. We need a sustainable world. He has things that he can do independent, like Obama's done some things independent. 
Uh, he could also go to the next UN climate conference and say, hey folks, we need to do something completely different. The next one will be in Morocco. Um, I guess next to say he wouldn't, be, well, he would have just been elected then. Uh, but anyway, he, he can do that. Uh, what were the other parts of your question? Because I think I've missed Yeah, that. so um, how would he be able to leverage the use of soft power? Right. Well, I, you know, he isn't so great on this one issue. His statements on Syria really weren't great. It was, he kind of joined the chorus of people said, let's go kill them all. And, you know, what's true is the next generation will step forward. They're, we're not going to kill them all. We'll kill that generation, but the, another generation will step forward. We've just got to stop our intervention there, even if it means that we're not, we're just making the slaughter worse. You know, you have all these refugees that are ending up in Europe right now. We've killed the only person, politician I've seen that spoke truth about this, and I would, about the Paris, the terrorist attacks on Paris was Brad Paul. Right. And he said, you know, we've killed three million people there, which I think is a really good estimate if you include the sanctions against Iraq in the early 90s. And they're angry. They're going to be angry about that. So we need to cut, stop killing people, and we need to start figuring a way to break negotiations. But we just can't keep, you're not going to, you know, kill them into agreement. Right. You know, it just isn't going to happen. You know, you, that needs to end and negotiations need to commence. And you're going to be negotiating with really hard people, but the really horrible people, but we've killed more people than those really horrible people. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? You know, I've spent a lifetime of looking at what this country, this country does all over the globe. You know, is it just the Middle East? Look what we did in Cambodia. Look what we did in Vietnam. You know what we did in Cambodia? Khmer Rouge killed two million people and they, the Vietnamese attacked them and drove them up into the mountains. We rearmed the, Viet, the, the, the Khmer Rouge. We rearmed them through Thailand. And we made Pol Pot the Cambodian representative of the United Nations. He was their leader. It was already known at that point what they had done, the atrocity that they had done, two million people. So I, I you know, I, um, I've lived through a lifetime of that. I can go country by country by country by country, continent by continent of our interventions in those places. I once sat in a meeting in Bangkok of the social, the, the social justice organizations of the uh, of of Asia, um, and I was like the only person in the United States in the room. I just kind of I knew these people through trade uh, stuff, corporate globalization. And, they just, you know, they weren't trying to speak to me. I was this little nothing in the room. Uh, they were just talking about themselves. And they, one country, person from one country after another, got up and in the course of what they had to say, they would talk about how what we had done had affected them in a negative sort of way. And that was just one part. And you can go through, you know, Latin America the same way. You can go to Chile and the coup. You know, you can go to the generals in Argentina, you can go to the coup in, in Brazil, you can go to the attempt to get rid of Chavez in Venezuela, you know, on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So we just need to stop our interventions. We're not peacemakers. Uh, and we have I, I myself from like from poor country, I'm from Republic of Uzbekistan, which uh, is a the, the most corrupt country in the world. You can check it. The most corrupt country in the world that doesn't have war. That's not in the, in the situation of war. So, uh, well, quality of life, to be honest, is not that terrible, well, that's bad. But the thing is, it, the, our president, Karimov, is actually supported by the United States. Uh -huh. you know, because the United States gave him weaponry, you know, uh, right. airplanes, all these things, tanks, and people just cannot up like uprise against him because he has so much of support from like military power. You know, it's like in this, this, this. He also United States keeps Central Asia under control. You know, because because yep. oil, because Uzbekistan is the most populous country, which has obviously the biggest military right. capacity, and that is terrible. And I'm here because I'm in United States because United States supports a crazy dictator in my country. Right. I mean, right. it doesn't. It doesn't feel good. I understand. I see that.
Yeah, and I've, I really had 71, not 71 years. I've been active since the 60s. And, you know, it's just one country after another after another. We need to know that we're not the glorious, shining star in the sky for most of the people of the world. We're something quite different. Who knows who Dave Robix is? He just sang here this weekend. He has this remarkable so song called the St. Patrick Battalion. Um, and it was about 200 Irishmen that came to the United States and they were inscripted and they were shipped off to fight the Mexican-American uh, War. And they, they came from oppression. Their country was occupied at that point. They came from oppression and they looked at what's happening along the border. And the, his lyrics are from Dublin City to San Diego. We saw freedom divide. We formed the St. Patrick's Battalion and we fought on the Mexican side. They were appalled about what they were saying and they didn't have deep roots in this country and they just kind of saw you know, what was happening in front of their eyes. And so they were all killed. A, a lot of them were killed, the St. Patrick's Battalion. But that's just one tiny little, tiny little example. I, I used to live in Asia. Boy, the, the people from the, around the world that I knew there, they thought very differently than Americans. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that some of you might think that some of what I've said is horrible. Uh, but. When you go outside of this country, it, it's a real, uh, to a large extent, a real different sort of thing. I was in a bar in Asia with my son looking at, looking at the World Cup, and everyone was against the United States. They were playing someone. It didn't matter who they were playing. They, everyone in that bar would have been for the other country. And he was just shocked because he had never witnessed anything like that. And they were, it was because they had these feelings. Uh, these are people from England, Australia, and places like that. So it's, it's real different when you get a perspective outside of this country. Africans told me that the, the Africans I worked with Peace Corps, I didn't understand Vietnam. I would even taken a class at this university about Vietnam. Didn't get it at all. And they, they, these Africans said, what is this about Vietnam? You know, we heard about this war. They, did, they probably didn't even know it was Vietnam. And they said, you know, are you all going all across an ocean to fight a battle against a people, you know, there? And it just didn't make no, any sense at all to them. These were people that pride themselves on being warriors. They really do. Um, and they, it just didn't make any sense to them. And I had never, you know, I'd taken this class, but yeah, I still didn't kind of get it. And in that instance, I got it. I mean, at least a portion, one small portion of it. I got it. Um, other questions? Um, so a lot of times, well, in the past, I've heard activists, especially when I used to be part of the ISO, I'm a DSA member, so. Cool. And I know Michael Corbin, and nice. who's the woman that was in the journalist department who's now in Syracuse? Dana Cloud. Huh? Dana Cloud. Yeah, yeah. Dana Cloud. Yeah. So I'm really big on changing my personal actions in uh -huh. order to like reflect what I believe in uh -huh. and to affect change. And a lot of times with activists who like to organize, um, they kind of emphasize more the organizing and like political activism and kind of say that small personal actions don't really make a difference in the big scheme that we need to change the system and, and policies and whatever. They're right. So, <laughs> they're, they're right. But it's also important to live by your values. Yeah. That's really important. And you can be a shining star to other people in terms of those terms, terms also. So I'm not discounting that at all. But it's also the way we change it is that we join together and do something about it. That's how, that's how we change, make real change. That's how it's always happened, in my lifetime at least. But doing what you say is also important. Because um, there have to be, you know, there have to be million stars in the sky, in, you know, anyway. <laughs> Other questions? I think we're just about out of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me, thank you for coming so much, Jerry Locke. Uh, this has been a pleasure on my part too. So thank you. And if you if you don't have uh, if you haven't signed up um, and you're not uh, connected with uh, 
UT Austin for Bernie, you might want to sign up on one of these sheets. You can like our Facebook page. Um, also, as Katie mentioned, we have these two events coming up, or phone banking events coming up, and volunteering at headquarters. So just to yet another plug for that. If you value your future, please <laughs> work for Bernie. This is once in a lifetime, or at least my lifetime opportunity to have someone at the top that really makes sense. So please, please work for him. No, my bicycle. My, my, my knees are really bad. I drove. I fell on Saint Street.